Welcome to Talking Point. Uh, joining us today is Ajay Srivastava of Dimensions Consulting. Morning, Ajay. Thanks for joining in. Uh, it's an exciting morning to catch you on. Things have settled on the street, at least for now, and it's, of course, more importantly, a Friday. Ajay, as we are getting into 2024 with a little bit of volatility, what do you expect from this calendar year? Do you think returns of 10 to 15 percent are on the anvil? And what factors, in your opinion, uh, may play spoiled sport or actually support the markets? See, you know, if you're targeting a 10, 15 percent return, then why would you want to be in equities in 2024? Then you might as well be in debt, which is going to give you a much superior return, even if it is gifts, is going to be a super return. OK, so you don't need to be in equity if your target is 10, 15 percent. You know, given our interest rates, our equity target has to be a minimum 20 percent return. Otherwise, we're not doing fairly to our portfolios. And for that, you need to stick to themes. Don't worry about the market. Market does its own thing. You may not be in IT totally altogether. You may be in partly in banks or may not be in it. So I think the focus has to be on what themes are you running and build those themes continue to run. You know, the three, four theme which have run for the investors last year has been real estate, has been defense, has been capital goods. I think if you, that sums up the whole market really return. Leave aside the small cap, which has been you know, done what it's supposed to do in normal times. So therefore, one needs to focus upon and say whether the same theme will work or not work. And I think those themes are good to go for a 21% returns in this market. Anything below that, then why would you want to risk your money in this market? Ajay, very fair point, but the fact remains the long-term returns on the Nifty have been early teens. And I know while we can aspire for 20% plus returns, then are we saying that the broader markets is probably the best place to be? And I'm talking about a long-term return average, not a year, one year, 20%, one year, and 5% another. You know, I wish uh, I could answer the question that long term, every time we talk about long term is when the market is down, we look at long term. When the market is up, we start looking at the shorter term. I think, you know, you know, that phrase called what long term. What does long term mean? It depends on people, the investor's horizon. If you're 75 years old, your long term is all of five or seven years. If you're 30 years old, your long term is 45 years. So I think each investor has his own determination of what is long term for him. What are the objectives of saving? But I would simply say at the end of the day that given the way the compounding works, if your portfolio is not doing well in the short term, it's very difficult for you to catch up all those compounding over the years and carry on the long term. So, yeah, I, I do not know Nifty, you know, whether it's 19, 20, 21 percent, then you just need to buy the index at the end of the day. You don't have to worry about it. Keep buying the index and ride the index over a period of 20, 30 years. If that is one objective, then your volatility of stock sectors, et cetera, disappears. But as we all do, most of us invest for ourselves. Most of us are in PMS. Most of us do investment for others. For them, year-to-year -year comparisons become equally important. And that's what the point I'm saying is that, yes, long-term is important, but at the end of the year, one looks at the balance sheet and says, what have we done with our funding? So there is a criterion to invest in index and leverage long-term, but there's a criterion to say, I need to make my money go to work. And when money goes to work, I need to make a return superior to the market. And in this market, you know, which is a cause with opportunities. Yes, there are valuation issues, tremendous valuation issues and lots of stock, but also opportunities. Which nation in the world is having three IPOs every week? You're getting new, new companies coming up. You've got the hotel companies on a spree, which we've never seen. Capital good, railway good sector, which unbridled growth that we've never seen. So, you know, to temper ourselves down to say last year was good, therefore we should look at less. I don't think that's the right way to go in a market which is going gangbusters and, you know, hopefully with the election result out of the way is going to be the next leg of the rally. Right. Uh, Ajay, then talking about the next leg and talking about those superior returns, uh, in your opinion, what sectors in calendar year 2024 could provide investors with those opportunities? See, I think, that's what I said, we don't need to change our themes very much. At the end of the day, the theme remains capital goods, the theme remains hotels, the theme remains airlines, the theme remains what we did well in last year defense. I don't think we need to change the theme. You know, it's not going to happen that suddenly sugar mills will start to give you superior returns. In an election year like this, commodity players are going to have a tough time because government is not going to let prices go up. You just saw sugarcane prices going up by 20 rupees at, this morning at the end of the day. Therefore, I think one would you know, focus on the same sectors and do not try to hunt for value at the lower end in people like companies like sugar, cement, fertilizer. I think these are three consumer retail. 
I think that's going to be the bummer of the year, if you ask me, because purchase price is down dramatically. The, the companies will sell to consumers at the middle, upper end, doesn't matter which end, are all facing retailing companies. Tremendous pressure on demand falling at all. And, you know, the whole thing is that the consumer spending is changing. What we were spending earlier on, say, let's say clothes, we are now spending on holidays. What we are spending on holidays earlier in hotels, we're now spending holidays in destinations which we never went for. So, you know, the nature of consumption is changing, nature of basket is changing, and we need to follow it. What is not changing? Government spending on railways, government spending on infrastructure, government support spending on renewable power, power sector. I think government spending on defense and to Indian companies, that's not changing. So why reinvent? Why do things which we don't require to be done? Government has told you we want to spend money of is it, you know, serious amount of money on railways. Why just follow it, the path of it? My view is keep doing what you're doing correctly in the last year. If government does what it does in the current year, what it did in the last year, you'll be safer there where you were last year compared to finding new places to invest. This is very interesting, Ajay, because I think a lot of people have talked about how they would rather be in sectors that do not actually have a reliance on government. And it's nice to hear that you believe otherwise. Sectors that you've highlighted have been multi-baggers of 2023. I mean, railways, uh, for example, IRFC is up 52% in the last 10 days. Are you still of the opinion that some of these counters like an IRFC, a Rail Vikas Nigam, maybe a Zen Technologies, Paras Defence, have the opportunity to do over 20 to 30 percent returns in this calendar year? You know, I'll ask you a simple question. Supposing you walk into the investing market today, you just got a job today. You didn't have the luxury of investing when the share was, uh, a Zen was 40 rupees, for instance, or whatever it, uh, you know, IRFC was. What are you going to do? Are you going to sit there? You know, the legacy of past prices is the, I think it's the peril of an aging person. And I try to get out of it because assuming I'm just walking in today or my children walk in tomorrow into the market for them, whether the HDFC bank IPO came at 40 rupees is irrelevant to them. My view is always that look forward to see whether, where you, where are you buying? Are you buying the right place where there's demand traction and more important, is there a moat there? If you have a moat, I think you are fine for investing it. You may go wrong on valuations, you can correct it. You don't have to put everything up front in a stock and you can correct it. And number two is, you know, you spoke about government policy. Unlike other sectors, in capital goods, government policy doesn't dictate so much because, you know, when you want to buy a railway locomotive engine, there are only two companies in the world who can supply it to you. So you can't go and dictate the price to them. So, you know, so unlike a sugar or a cement where you can price control and do things like that, you can't do that in some of the sectors where there are also MNCs sitting here with the technology. So, you know, differentiate between what can be impacted by policy, what not. And defense, not very clear policy, Indian companies are going to play a big role. So, you know, and we just even started on it. You know, if you look at total defense purchases, is not even 10% of what India spends on defense from Indian companies. Imagine five years, seven years down the line, what kind of defense expenditure we're talking about and how much will come to Indian companies, whether collaborators or directly. So, you know, these sectors are, will get influenced, but not so directly like the cement, sugar, etc., with the government or the steel, with the government can influence this. I want to cut the price and therefore I will drop the tariff and let imports roll in so that steel companies don't make money or I'll ban the export of steel if the prices go up. That is not possible in these sectors, and that's where the advantage lies, even though government is the biggest consumer of these industries. So, if I ask you for your favored uh, stocks where you still see those sort of returns, uh, in the, I'm going to try my luck on this one, on railways, uh, what, what is it that you like? Because this rally isn't stopping, and I agree with yeah, you. See, the good part is, I can't name the stock, the good part is there are only five stocks, including two MNCs, which supply to the railways at the end of the day. Three Indian companies, two MNCs. There's nothing, you don't need to be a, you know, you can just Google and say who are the suppliers and you'll find the names at the end of the day. So I think the good part, you don't need to spend your, your agents trying to find the hidden guy who does everything for them. There are only three companies who have been enabled for coverage, for instance, which is a safety system. You can go on the railways net, you'll find the three companies are enabled. One is doing very well, the other two are struggling, but may catch up. So, you know, so if you read the Prime Minister talking and the railways talking about coverage every day, that those companies are enabled, means they can only get the orders for the next five years. Nobody else can step in. Locomotive engine, there are only two companies who supply to the railways in India. So, you know, so I'm sorry I can't name the companies, but it's not so difficult to find 
what is driving the purchase of railways and where the critical equipment is coming from. And just piggyback, you know, we don't need to worry about it. And the government is, if it continues in power, I think the 10 lakh crore capex should move to about 15 lakh crore next year. And that's 50% jump in expenditure. So, yes, they are multi-baggers, but I don't have the luxury if I'm a younger person to go and participate predated. I can go back in time. I love to go back in time and redo. Every investor's dream is to look at yesterday's newspaper and do a trade. I promise you that much. But unfortunately, we can't. So let's gamble on the future. Let's talk about uh, another sector that is more inward looking and actually has been, uh, I think the only turnaround story is the fact that uh, demand locally will pick up. And I'm talking with specialty chemicals. These were the darlings of D Street uh, over two years ago. But the last two years have been rough. There is expectation that in the next two quarters, things will stabilize. Do you think specialty chemicals, you know, has that opportunity for investors to earn multi-bagger sort of returns? Would this smaller sector feature on your, port on your core portfolio? See, it is right now we have zero, absolute zero in it, and for two reasons. One, what has happened is that, you know, this sector again does wonders for two, three years, then settles down for a normal existence. Capacity in India has gone up tremendously. And what was supposed to be China plus one trade has not materialized. The fact remains that China plus one trade has actually become China plus US, China plus Europe. Trade. So what you see, you talk to customers today, you want globally you travel and you see most companies are what they're doing. They're saying, okay, whatever we're doing in China is fine. Whatever extra in pharma side, if you look at specialty chemicals, they're saying we'd rather do it in Europe or rather do it in America. It's not necessarily that India has got the bulk of the business. That's not what has happened. Number two is capacity has gone up tremendously. And the third part is that thanks to the biotech uh, dry down, which has happened in the U.S., the new opportunities from new companies has dried up dramatically. That was India's driving point was new companies coming up and asking them to come to you know, a cost economic sector like India. That's not happening today from the U.S. So if you look at China plus one moving to China plus Europe and U.S., the Americans have not dropped China as a supplying source, which was expected to happen. Too much capacity addition in India at, the, at this point of time and biotech demise of the biotech and the smaller sector in America, thanks to the funding winter, all have kind of compared a demand compression. And you will continue to see the fact that the demand for whether it's a CDMO or demand for specialty chemical for industries will be static with lower prices in the current year. So I don't think in the current year, we're going to see some dramatic reversals of fortune for these companies. They're struggling for order book at this point of time, as we understand. Some may do better than the others. And large, second large, the agrochemical, which was a major driving sector for this industry. If you look at specialty chemical, agrochemical gave the maximum profit. That sector is a serious doldrums around the world. Our supply, price, pressure, all put together. So this year, I don't think it's going to be a turnaround. And the stocks have not corrected that much. You know, the stocks are still 40, 50 P at the end of the day for most bigger companies, certainly not less than 30 Ps. So you're degrowing with a 30, 40 P. Now, you can, investors can still buy it, but to get a return is going to be difficult. So I think I would let it go by for this year, let the system adjust, then go back to it, but certainly not in 2024. Interesting, Ajay. It's always great talking to you. We'll take a quick break. We'll Thanks. come back and continue our conversation, so stay tuned.
Welcome back. We are in conversation with Ajay Shrivastava on Talking Point. Ajay, any of the large cap banks uh, have the potential to do 20% plus returns this year? I think the PSU banks, if you ask me, the large PSU banks can definitely do you wonders. I don't know 20 or not, but I think they will do you wonders because their business is stabilized and they're lending to the industrial sector a lot better than others. They will go to the power sector. They can lend longer term. You know, the asset liability fear of private banks is not so prevalent in nationalized banks, so they have greater power to lend to projects at this point of time. So if they can, they're still okay value. It's not, they're not certainly undervalued like last year. They've gone of some fair value. But I think among the banks, I would say the top three PSU banks would perhaps be the places where one can be if you want to be in the financial sector to get a superior return in the market. So it's PSU, bigger PSU banks, I think would be the order of the day. So I'm assuming you don't have the same emotion or thought towards the three to four large private sector banks that have been in the news in the last few days. See, you know, I keep saying that this is what competition does. Those were complacent elephants which were sitting there because RBI did not issue a banking license for almost 10 years. So they made hay, they made money, and they actually thought they were good at their job. The fact is, what the thing has told them is when the fintechs came in, when the new age companies came in, when the wealth management companies walked in, they took away the, the you know, the cheese moved and they were still slumbering in their old world. And I don't see any difference today. The quality of service one is getting from places like HDFC banks, etc. that we bank with them. It's pathetic, absolutely pathetic. The only reason we bank with them, it's convenient, you're there in the past. But the shocking quality of service standard, which has now prevailed compared to you know, you ask anybody who does stock market trading versus through a banking uh, brokerage firm versus a direct trading, they'll tell the difference in quality of service. So I think competition, a lack of competition made them complacent. HDFC, of course, different animal paying the huge price for bailing out HDFC Limited. That bailout is still continuing. You know, one can argue the FIs were dumb. I think there are some FIs can be dumb also, right? It's not necessarily that all whites can have to be smart about it, that they thought that's the greatest thing in the world. It'll pay the price. The pain will go through the system. And, you know, but as investors, you don't need to go through the pain. FIs have to invest by a certain module, certain thing, norm that they need to match the index. They need to match the weightages. Investors don't need to do that. So why would you want to go to a slumbering elephant at this point of time? And they, are, they don't know which way to go, to sell retail, industrial, working capital. You know, it, so its model is all fuzzed up. So I would simply say the safer bet would be your new age companies in the fintechs, your new age wealth management companies who also carry benefit of carry at the end of the day because they have AIFs, et cetera, put your money there. And if you really love banks, I would say the top PSU banks would be the place to be safe because they will lend to large projects and they will make decent amount of interest income at the end of the day. And RBI governor is clear. He is not going to let retail lending go out of control. So I, I hope you saw the message yesterday from Davos. So all in all, I don't think so. Private banks, I think they need to get more competitive. I think they need to just smell the coffee and get real about customer service. Right. Ajay, a very quick uh, question. IT sector, you've been optimistic on the space, and I did read an article from you a few months ago where you said tech should remain as part of a core portfolio. We've seen earnings now, and the street reaction is mixed, right? Do you feel like this sector could pull in the kind of returns that we are hoping for? Of course, you can't ignore tech. In this world, the only constant theme for the last few decades and the future is technology. How would you approach the tech space? What is the specifics that you would play with here? See, you know, tech space has, you know, traditional tech space definition used to be only software companies. That's not the definition we use. The tech space, if you know, if you were to look at it, includes the universe which is coming to the new age companies, includes the universe also to things like telecom. Telecom is the biggest user of the space. And I think in India, it's, it's worked across larger software companies, some small, but also telecom space has done wonders to us and will continue to do wonders to us. Some of the new age companies, which we call a tech because they're primary tech base, are have also done wonders. So just broad-based horizon to say tech is not all about people doing service to America, it's broad-based to include your telecom companies, include some of the new age companies, then you set up a tech basket and it'll be good. And the good part about tech environment today, that and particularly the software companies, no equity dilution over the last decade or so. Investors' music, dividend and buyback continues to be suffered. So you get your money back and don't spend into stuff that you don't, you know, acquisition, et cetera, we don't make money for the company. So third, 
at the end of the day, you can't recreate the outsourcing giants. No matter, you know, things will change. And just now what we want, India and Asia and Africa are still to come up to the bandwagon of technology. Look at our Indian bank spend on technology. Next to nothing. We just spoke about customer service and problems. India has spent barely anything compared to a JP Morgan or a city or a Chase. Now the city is a great example to take either way at this point. My album, my, my first company, but not a good example. But the fact remains that tech is critical, as you said. It's important. If these companies evolve, I think they will do wonders. India is going to be a huge opportunity. You just saw TCS got bailed out by BSNL contract. Can you believe it? When were you thinking or think about TCS getting bailed out by an Indian government contract? But India is going to be a big. Africa is going to be big. Asia is going to be very, very big for tech. So don't write it off. It's done re decently well. If you look at the last seven, eight years, it's done very well for you without the volatility that you see in other sectors. So I don't see as an Indian investor not investing and keeping a portfolio in tech. Just broad base it. So you're not just dependent on the three giants or three or four mid-cap companies servicing the U.S. and you'll be fine. You know, how do you, it's like buying U.S. without buying NASDAQ. Can you believe it? And therefore, when I say tech means buy India, also look at NASDAQ companies. You know, we can invest abroad, allowed to legally invest it. So just without tech, there is no world. So without tech investment, there can't be a portfolio. Agree, the two big sectors are fin and tech, and you can't ignore them as any country grows. Thank you, Ajay. It was always and always has Thank been you a very pleasure much. chatting you, with you. You have a great weekend. You too. We'll hopefully see you soon. With that, it's a trap on Talking Point. Thanks for watching.